So first of all, thank you very much for uh, for the invitation. This the free seats are up here close to me. Um, I have to we have to talk about sustainable design today, and we will talk about materials. But I think before we start, there are a few things I just want to get clear. I come from a background that is both very practical. I have designed many different things, some from yacht interiors to uh, furniture, installation, products, uh, different things. So I have one side of me that's quite practical and has uh, experience from industry. And then I have the other side that's uh, more research-based. Um, and for the last 13 years, I have been working exclusively with sustainable design, which is what we're going to talk about today. I will say design and designer many times. I don't necessarily mean fashion designer or product designer. When I say designer, I mean anyone involved with uh, designing this physical man-made world. So anything from an engineer to a, an architect to a fashion designer to an artist. And I will also talk about product several times. And product, perhaps we have a tendency to think about a chair or a lamp. But when I say product, I really mean physical man-made objects that takes a material to be to come into life yeah so just to be clear about this um let's see if this works it did before when i didn't touch it let's see i'll try again i'll move closer and i'll use the computer so oh maybe now Well, never mind. We'll just do it here. It's fine. Yeah. So anyway, let's start somehow with what is really sustainability. So um, a few years ago, I was walking on a beach in Denmark in the small island of Lue. And on the beach, I found uh, this piece of flint. I thought it was an axe. I've been told later that it, it is probably more likely a, a knife. But... Whatever it is, it is a piece of flint that has been manipulated and handled and shaped by a human being more than 3,000 years ago. And when I found it, I, I was thrilled. I was so happy. I felt I have really, really found a treasure, having something in my hand that somebody else had shaped so many years ago. After a few hours of being very happy, I started thinking about so what would happen or what will happen in a hundred years time or maybe 300 years time or even further ahead when somebody walks on the beach or walks somewhere and find a piece of one of my plastic lamps. I was slightly worried that maybe they would not have the same sort of like excitement. They might even think that they had just found a piece of trash. So I sort of thought a lot about what is it I leave behind. The other thing which I find very interesting and something that I keep working with is that this piece here, it was very neutral in some ways because it was lying next to other pieces of flint and other types of stones. So in many ways, it, it was neutral. It was just there. Somebody had manipulated it, but it was just there. It didn't do any harm. And sometimes when we have in this sort of technical uh, advanced world we're living in, we tend to forget as designers that all the materials that surround us, even in here, all the chairs you're sitting on, the walls, the lamps, everything in here originally has come from natural resources, resources existing on this planet. But the interesting thing is that probably none of you, I guess, would claim that right now we are sitting in the middle of nature. So somehow we have manipulated those materials to a degree where they are no, not, no longer recognizable as something that naturally is part of resources that exist on this planet. So I think that's two things to take with you, or that I take with me, at least sort of when I think about sustainability, one is our legacy. 
And the other one is that when I start looking at some, how something is built or how, how a material is made, I often consider how far away from, from nature is this actually. So, <clears throat> when we work with sustainability, there is no other way than working with it holistically. And I know holistic, this word holistically is sort of like one of those words that is so used that we can hardly bear to hear it anymore, but it really is true. We see so many designers grabbing on to one thing and then they say that product is sustainable. But really when we talk about sustainability, we need to look at sort of like the, the whole, which means that we need to consider the materials that we use how they were excavated, how they were cultivated, by whom, how we put them together, how we mix them, how we shape them into a product, how we design that product in a way that can be disassembled so that it can be repaired, so it can be reused, so it can be updated, so we can extract those materials again. How we make sure that that product suits the system, a system with an infrastructure of legislations of waste management systems. And finally, these three, the system, the product, and the materials, that's what we're going to talk mostly about today. There's also a paradigm. The paradigm is the reality that we are designing into, defined by a political uh, context, uh, by culture, by mega trends. So these things are interrelated, even sort of like the materials and the paradigm can be. So for instance, like let's say you are, forward thinking you go out you find a really new cool material you think it's really great you work with it you design a product with it but the users are not ready for it they they just see maybe you have designed let's say a, a completely neutral uh, a hemp dress decided not to bleach it not to dye it and you think it's fantastic as a designer you can see all the benefits but the user just sees a boring dress so sometimes this thing about how, what is it, we, what kind of paradigm are we designing into can be quite interesting. It's not something we're going to talk so much about today because I want to talk a bit more about the system um, to begin with at least. So the system of sustainability, one of um, perhaps the most comprehensive attempts to to talk about systems and how things are related to sustainability are the UN development goals. They are good and interesting from the point of view that they are that show us the variety of things that we need to consider when we design for sustainability. I also see them used in a wrong way over and over and over again. I because one of the the sort of like one of the things that, that the, oh, I don't want to call it a weakness, but when we just, if we just make a design and then afterwards think about, okay, which, which category does my product fit into? You can nearly always find one. I published a book last year. It was made with FSC certified paper and it was related to design education. Whoops, quality education number four. Now it's sustainable. That way of thinking. It doesn't work. If you want to use this, then you need to look at all of them. There may be some that are not relevant for your product, but if you want to work, use these, then you need to consider all of them. They are being criticized for being too focused on the human civilization side. So to say that if we go by these, we will thrive short term as a human race, but we are sawing off the branch we're sitting on because it's too little, too little focus on the environment. Mm, and why is this? Well, um, when we look at the planetary boundaries, so looking at the envir and environmental aspects that we desperately need to deal with, this is, this is why. So you will see that we have the, the safe operating space, which is the green one, and we have several areas where we have passed. <clears throat> the climate change, you all know about that one. And this is the one we constantly talk about. We talk about it for good reasons. 
But we also need to be careful because many of the others we are, for, we are forgetting about or we are not dealing with. We are so focused on measuring CO2 emissions or greenhouse gas emissions in general that sometimes we forget the others. You as designers will need to be able to design for improving biodiversity. You need to relate to biodiversity in your products. This is the one to the left of the of the um, of the climate change and related to biodiversity we have a <clears throat> and maybe even bigger crisis than what we have with with the greenhouse gas emission and sometimes it's 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 and you know it's complicated i have worked with a lot of companies who make products in plastic many of them they want to change from fossil fossil based plastic to bio bio based plastic the reason they want that is because, <clears throat> sorry, it scores better. And it scores better because typically the, the bioplastic is made from plants. Plants absorb CO2. So this is why they score better. But that is if we look at it isolated. If we look at it in a broader context and see, so where did the bioplastic come from? Well, frequently it comes from sugarcane. Sugarcane is typically grown in Brazil. And if that sugarcane field has been, has replaced forest, then suddenly it's not so interesting anymore because one hectare of monoculture traditionally grown sugarcane with pesticides and fertilizers and so on does not give the same quality as the rainforest does particularly when it comes to methane, which is one of the greenhouse gases that we have way too little focus on. So the methane is actually absorbed typically by soil. So what we have when you have in sort of like an old forest, you will really absorb a lot of methane. So it's just to say that there is a complexity that goes beyond just measuring CO2 that we will need to deal with. Um, the other one that we often can be hard to work with. I mean, we could spend a whole day talking about these, of course, but the novel entities, the novel entities are all the materials and substances and chemicals that didn't exist before that we have introduced that have now landed out in nature and is jeopardizing the balance that is provoking, you know, changes that suddenly mean that you know reproductive systems in animals and human beings are not working the way they should do and these so novel entities are coming out of course with wastewater and with uh, you know any kind of uh, pollution and fumes but also via um additives in waste that's lying around in microplastics and so on so anyway it's just to say we have um we we need to focus on the environmental side to a, to a lot to a lot or oh, a much larger degree. Let's see why will it? Oh, here we go. Um, just to stay with the system thinking, just for a minute, circular economy is widely adapted on from the point of view of um, of companies, but also on a European level also in many other places in the world, people are working with circular economy. But it means a lot of the legislations are being designed at the moment following circular economy. So circular economy is the idea that we're trying to design a system where we are where designing out waste, where we're trying to always be able to, to recover the materials. And we want to do this because, of course, we want to avoid having to new use, get new materials all the time. We want to be able to keep the material in circulation and we're doing this for the environment, but we're also doing it because we have no other choice. So many of the sort of rare minerals and metals that we need for our electric cars, for our windmills, for the whole green transition, we may, you know, if we're lucky, be able to buy some of China. But if not, if we look at European level, we have them, but they're locked up in products. So we desperately need to design those products in ways that we can retrieve materials. And one, when I see this used, and, and a lot of companies are at the moment really struggling to and fighting to, to change to into a transition where they're going circular. And 
often what we see is there's a lot of focus on the outer circles, on the recycle and the biodegradation. Of course, it's more interesting <clears throat> if we can, if we can, before we get there, because it takes a lot of energy and a lot of, you know, uh, effort and, and energy and water and so on, resources to actually go and let's say, uh, shred some plastic, clean it, uh, smelt it, make small pellets so it's ready to be used again. It's it's much more much better to stay within the smaller circle. It's quite obvious that it's better to reuse something than to recycle it. Reuse the chair the way it is, maybe repair it, use it again. It's always going to be better than to get to the outer circle recycle. But we need to make it we need to make sure that when our products can no longer be used, that they can actually, we can recover the materials. So it also means that sometimes as designers, we have this sort of like desperate need to, um, to uh, get hold of um, new material, but sometimes we need to think about how can we use what is already there, because the moment when we, you can even think of sort of like when we have the, the cultivating, the mining, the processing and the raw material, the moment we can sort of stay in a loop with the design and the production and the reuse or use, this is naturally more sustainable than if we go out and, and use new materials. Um, I should also perhaps just say now, I sort of like criticize the UN development goals a little bit. One of the things uh, that circular economy, we, you know, you should definitely follow circular economy. I just want to point out that of course, the moment, um, one of the things that this system does not break with is our sort of system where we have a success based on growth. So from the point of view, let's say that uh, we have this chair here. If we made that chair slightly more sustainable and called it a sustainable chair, of course, it's better than the other one if we compare it. But if we at the same time sell two chairs or three chairs of the very sustainable chair, we might end, actually end up with a end result that is worse. So if we keep just thinking about having this sort of success criteria of selling more and producing more and making more, well, then circular economy is not going to save us. Anyway, so let's talk about products now. And, and the good news when it comes to the criteria for sustainable products is that whereas we with the systems thinking, uh, there is a lot of, I don't want to say a lot of disagreement, but we, I would say we are definitely not, not within research, there's still not full consensus and agreement about what is the perfect sustainable system. But what we do see within the criteria for sustainable products is that there is some agreement about what is it the product needs to to live up to what is the product what does this product need to be for it to be considered sustainable and um, <clears throat> no toxins is of course related to um, what we saw before with the novel entities that we have introduced durability in general we want things to be as as durable as possible in general, because not always. It could be, for instance, like if we if we have a product that we're designing a product that is that we need to that's disposable. We want it to be used for for three weeks, like a yogurt pot. We don't want that to last for ten years. Um, maintenance, uh, minimize resource consumption, which gives you know this is obvious. Not just uh, water, el electricity, and materials, but everything. Mm, maintenance friendly which is sort of the opposite of what has been popular for a long time, the maintenance free, which basically means that something lasts for a time and then it breaks and you can't fix it. Then we have a uh, design for disassembly and repair. When you design something for disassembly, you can take out parts and replace them. And you can take out the different materials and reuse and recycle them. We want to be able to recycle or biodegrade things. The transportation is sometimes very important, not always. Then you have the alternative forms of biomass and waste materials. Now here is one that's really quite interesting for designers. 
and also quite difficult because we have very much been trained to use standard materials. The moment we start using waste materials, we frequently find ourselves in materials that have flaws. We find materials that are less processed. So it can be quite difficult to adapt to this one. Social responsibility. It's more important when I design things, let's say in Bangladesh, than if I design them in Denmark, because there might not be the same laws protecting the workers. Aesthetics. I actually, I should probably say that the first one's up here until we get to the social responsibility thing. When, I, when you read books <clears throat> written by engineers, these are the things they will, they will include. And they will include those because those can be measured. But there are things related to sustainability that we cannot measure, but that is still important. So for instance, like the aesthetics, if you have something <clears throat> that you care for, that you find beautiful, you will look after it and you will repair it and you will keep it. So aesthetics is interesting to look at. This is slightly combined, you know, sort of like um, connected to the perceived obsolescence. So the perceived obsolescence is like, let's say in your cupboard, you have a pair of trousers. They're perfectly fine, but they look old. They look old, not because they're sort of like dirty or worn, but because they have a cut that was popular four years ago. So when you, you feel they're outdated, this is when you perceive them to be obsolete. So anyway, when you, these are the things you will need to work with. And of course, these all have like, you know, we could spend hours talking about each of them, which we're not going to. One of the interesting things about them is that combined with this, probably we heard it before, this 80% of the decisions uh, related to sustainability, you should take in the design process. So the environmental impact is in many ways determined during the design phase. This has been sort of like a quote that has been floating around. I'm not sure whether it's 80%, but when you look at the criteria for sustainable design, I think it's, it's getting quite, quite obvious that, um, that many of these, this is not something you can sort of like solve later than the design process. These are in the design process. The way I found out, um, was uh, I started out opening a design studio in 2005. I designed yachts, not very sustainable. Um, and in 2008, I thought, okay, it was going quite well, but it was not sustainable what I was doing and I really wanted to change it. <clears throat> so, sorry. I really wanted to change it. So what I did was I, I decided to read everything I could get my hands on that was written about sustainability. So I read Cradle to Cradle. I read um, CSR Politics, the Grundland, Grundland Report. I read um, quite detailed books uh, on um, the criteria for sustainable design. Now, um, of course, there was nowhere near the literature that we have today available at the time, but still there was quite a lot. I understood it all. So I thought, okay, fine. Now I know, now I know how to design for sustainability. And I, I realized that, that, I, that even though I now knew what I had to, you know, I understood the criteria, but I, I couldn't combine it with my designs. I had been taught a design process where you would start out with uh, conceptualizing idea generation, then I would start sketching I would start uh, drawing um, in computer different programs. I would maybe build a model. And finally, I would start doing some, some, um, some renders and I would have a design. But then I would have this design and how I couldn't fit those criteria and, and my design, they, they didn't match. So I realized two things from doing this. I realized that design process that I had been taught in design school was not compatible with these criteria for sustainable design. And I also realized that, um, that I, I only had a fraction of the knowledge about materials that I needed to design for these criteria. 
So those were the two things that sort of really have shaped most of my work, both in research, my sort of experimental work as, work as a designer, uh, my work with students, and so on. Because what I had been taught was the design process that was largely immaterial. And when the material and sort of like the production method was something that was being introduced quite late in the end, and really what you needed if you want to design for sustainability was a design process where the material and the production ideas about how things were going to be produced and tools and stuff like that, they needed to be there from the outset. So uh, one of the things I did was um, I, um, I started the material design lab at Copenhagen School of Design and Technology in 2013. And uh, it was, and, and I th still uh, to a large degree is today, uh, a big materials library. Uh, this was a com commercially available materials in collaboration with Material Connection New York. And apart from this, there was a big collection of raw materials, of binders, of finishes, of, and stories about materials. And finally, sort of like the most important um, part of this place uh, was, was the laboratory the lab itself. So one of the things I came to realize that when I was working with a design process where materials had to be present throughout and where I didn't just sort of like accept to work with standard materials, I found out that sort of the typical woodworking, wood, woodworking uh, workshops that you could find design schools or maybe metal workshops, they didn't really work. Because it was like they were designed to, to sort of like drill or saw shape, be you know, more sort of like work on a big scale. They were not really well, well suited to work more detailed with the material. The kind of laboratory workshop that you needed for that was more sort of a mixture between a natural scientific uh, laboratory, uh, something a chemist might feel comfortable in, a biologist, combined with something that looked like an industrial kitchen combined with a typical design prototyping workshop. So it was sort of like it had different things and, and um, mostly it wouldn't, it wouldn't look like this. Mostly it would look like this, um, you know, with students having and designers coming in, having materials everywhere. But the important question in this case here is why is it that this student could not just get the same knowledge from reading a book. Um, well, for first of all, she might not be able to find a book when you start working with non-standard materials and waste materials or things that are not typically used in, in the design world. You, you, you'd often find that there is nothing written about it. That's one thing. But the other thing is that what is involved when you want to learn about materials um, is something quite different. There is some kind of embodied understanding of materials that you need to be able to project and ideate what could actually be done with this material. And this comes from shaping it, from testing it, from experimenting with it, from smelling it, from stretching it, from combining it in all sorts of different ways. And now I'm just going to spend two minutes, I promise it won't be long, jumping into something that probably is almost closer to, uh, well, it's closer to neuroscience or, or cognitive science anyway. Uh, I want to tell you about embodied cognition because this is the explanation for why. Why you need to get your hands onto materials and tools and making. Why there's knowledge there that you cannot get from reading a book or not even from this lecture. So um, embodied cognition breaks with the idea of the dualism that we have seen in the West where the mind and, and the body are separate. So it provides an explanation of how and, what, um, and uh, the way our senses and our motor systems are involved in understanding and working with materials and tools. It also explains why creativity is not just some kind of abstract intellectual thing that happens out of nowhere, but actually something that is based 
on our experiences with the world, with emotions, with human beings, and in interaction with materials and tools and artifacts. So, in other words, um, you know, if you want to really understand the physical matter that constitutes products, what you need if you're going to design sustainable products, you need to do this. You need to get your, your hands on materials and tools. You need to get into making and testing things. And I suppose also, with, you know, one of the reasons why I'm saying this is because um, even though this might seem obvious to you, and maybe, you know, we are in a place where you have a fab lab, it's all about making. What we have seen from the, for the last 50 years in Europe and in the States is that even though that there's now a tendency to reopen workshops for a long, long time, design has become something that's been more focused on theory, more sort of an intellectual activity where many, many places have been closing down their workshops. So this is not just natural, it's actually something that we need to find a way to, to get into back into many design educations. And also from the point of view that we can work with digital design and basically we can start out and have a whole process where we work digitally without ever touching the material. So this is okay. If you have a huge embodied knowledge about how different materials work and behave. But if you're a student and you don't have that, or designer who are working with new material, you will still need to get that understanding of the material, you'll still need to go analog. So there is sort of like a, a knowledge that that we need from craft and working with materials that we cannot get uh, from the digital design process in the same way. And often what we see also is that it can really uh, push forward the way we, we are creative and imagine the way we can use digital tools, for instance, like a, with 3D knitting. If you know simply how to knit and purl by hand, you have a lot better understanding of what it means to do 3D knitting. So this thing about working in tandem and sometimes informing one another can, you know, can be very interesting. Now, the one of the things, of course, that is more complicated here is that uh, when we want to work with materials, we don't have sort of like a nice, smooth, clean studio. We actually end up having needing to have a space, a workshop space where we can actually work with things, with tools, with materials. This is uh, Jonas Edward, a Danish designer, and this is a picture from his, um, his workshop, which I quite like. Um, it's also one of the things that can be difficult in some schools because they may not have uh, the spaces um, available to work with. So if you were sitting in a, in a very clean classroom, it can be difficult to sort of pull out lots of dirty materials. and. And it can also be difficult for many designers who are sort of used to having a very clean studio with your computer and your desk and maybe a small room for 3D printing suddenly to, to change into this. The other quite interesting thing is that when we really get into uh, exploring materials and understanding them, and when we want to work with sustainability, you saw the sort of like the planetary boundaries. It requires quite a lot of knowledge. Some of that knowledge about sustainability, we can get from a book, we can read, we can go to lectures. But when we actually start also really wanting to get into understanding the physical world, to understanding how to work with materials, something interesting starts happening. And that is partly one, we need to bring back craft to a much larger degree than what we have now. But what often also happens is the um, needs to happen is that we need we, we move towards natural science. Natural science and art can easily coexist, but it's interesting to see how how we need knowledge from biology, how we need knowledge from chemistry, from material science to be able to understand what we're actually doing, and not just not just sort of uh, theoretical knowledge. We need the knowledge that 
is actually something we need to know how to, uh, for instance, experiment in a natural scientific way. We need to understand how to measure things. Things that might not be natural when we only, if you're working, um, um, sort of like things we might not have been taught if we have been coming from a more artistic founded uh, education. And, and freak also not, I often talk to engineers and are surprised about also how, I was always thought that, okay, if, it were, if I was an engineer, there would be many things I would understand better, but I'm not quite sure that that's always the case. So, um, in, the, in, in the food world, I don't think anybody would think or expect a chef to be able to design a dish, a new recipe, without knowing about all the ingredients, knowing about how they how they behave, how they taste in different ways, how you can manipulate them, how you can braise something slowly, or how you can fry something really hard. For some reason, we have got to a point where we don't expect the same knowledge about materials for a designer. But if we just think about how is that designer going to propose new, innovative, sustainable products without having that same kind of knowledge? And I often think about when I, I used to live in Barcelona, I came back in 2010 and I was quite, um, moved back to Denmark in 2010, I should say. And uh, it was really amazing to see how much had happened within food in Denmark or in the Scandinavia in general, that bit is a small revolution where chefs were uh, going out, finding all plants that we hadn't used for, for a century and different kind of ingredients that only our grandmothers knew how to prepare. They were preparing things that nobody thought could actually be food and using things grown in laboratories. This same kind of revolution that happened to within the food industry and within the, the, the culinary world, we're still waiting to have that. Or maybe we're seeing sort of like small, the first small sort of like seeds being planted in the design world now, but this is really what, what we need to, to get going with as well within design. So I have, uh, this is the end of it. And I have written a book about this, uh, about what, what does it mean to have materials as, present in the design process throughout? What does it mean to use iterative prototyping as a way of moving forward and defining a design? And of course, you know, sustainable design, what does it mean? Again, you cannot learn to design with materials from reading it, but you, you might gain some kind of knowledge. Anyway, that was all. <laughs>